Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. My name is Abby and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the SIA Incorporated third quarter 2024 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during that time, simply press the star key followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press star one a second time. Thank you. And I would now like to turn the conference over to Matthew Bate, SIA's Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. You may begin. Thank you, Abby. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to SIA's third quarter 2024 conference call. With me for today's call is SIA's President and Chief Executive Officer, Fritz Holzgrave. Before we begin, you should know that during this call, we may make some forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These forward-looking statements and all other statements that might be made on this call that are not historical facts are subject to a number of risks and uncertainties and actual results may differ materially. We refer you to our press release and our SEC filings for more information on the exact risk factors that could cause actual results to differ. I will now turn the call over to Fritz for some opening comments. Good morning, and thank you for joining us to discuss size third quarter results. While the underlying macro trends remain tepid in our view, our year-over-year -year results in the third quarter continue to reflect the growth experience since last summer. In the quarter, we averaged approximately 37,200 shipments per day compared to approximately 34,300 per day last year, or an increase of 8.5%. Our third quarter revenue of $842 million increased from last year's third quarter by 8.6% and is a record for any third quarter in our company's history. Yield or revenue per hundredweight, excluding fuel surcharge, increased 1.7%, reflecting a constructive pricing backdrop and the impact of changes in our mix of business. Revenue per shipment, excluding fuel surcharge, increased 0.9% despite a headwind from weight per shipment, which was down 0.8% in the quarter, and length of haul, which decreased modestly. Our third quarter operating ratio of 85.1% deteriorated 170 basis points compared to our operating ratio of 83.4% posted in the third quarter last year. While weight per shipment stabilized in the, into the third quarter, we continue to see some mixed headwinds from the softer industrial backdrop and the growth in retail business since last year's industry disruption. We remain intently focused on mix management and pricing init initiatives as seen in our contractual renewals which remained strong at 7.9%. During the quarter, we opened 11 new terminals and relocated one other, continue to execute our long-term strategy of improving our service and value proposition to the customer. 11 new terminals in the quarter is a record for any quarter in company history. I'm proud of the execution from our team. Each new opening represents its own unique challenges, especially those in new geographies. Most of the terminals opened in the quarter were in the Great Plains, a new geography for SIA, and in these locations enable us to extend our addressable market and provide direct service to customers in, the, in this area of the country. With these recent terminal openings, we're now able to provide direct service to all the contiguous 48 states, which significantly enhances our value proposition to our customers and confirms our position as a leading national LTL carrier. As with every new opening, these new terminals required investments in people, equipment, and technology, while entering a completely new geography requires additional investments in the customer experience. We are encouraged by early customer acceptance, and we're excited to expand our addressable market to better serve both new and existing customers. We are very pleased with the progress of our new terminal openings, especially those that opened in the second quarter. During the third quarter, these terminals continue to grow and become more efficient while still having been open for less than six months. This group of terminals improved their operating ratio by more than 10 points sequentially, further supporting the long-term strategy of increasing our addressable market and investing in the customer experience. While these terminals are not at a company market share or operating margin, they are profitable. Each terminal is a long-term investment that enables us to provide a solution to a customer in each market. The terminals open in the Great Plains in the third quarter allow us to directly service a new geography, and we're proud to bring the SIA name to new and existing customers in these communities. 
We remain committed to our training requirements for our team members in both new and existing markets, which is critical to building a SIA culture and enhancing the customer experience. Our teams are committed to accomplishing our growth strategy with an eye on always putting the customer first. Our customer first initiatives have been the cornerstone of our success over our 100 year journey, and we've seen our customer focus on display throughout each new terminal opening in the quarter. I'll now turn the call over to Matt for more details from our third quarter results. Thanks, Rick. As mentioned, third quarter revenue increased by 67 million to 842.1 million. Yield excluding fuel surcharge improved by 1.7% and yield decreased by 0.9% including fuel surcharge. Fuel surcharge revenue per workday decreased by 6.3% and was 14.8% of total revenue compared to 16.9% a year ago. Revenue per shipment excluding fuel surcharge increased 0.9% to 293.39 compared to 290.79 in the third quarter of 2023 and increased 0.9% sequentially from the second quarter of 2024. Tonnage per workday increased 7.7%, attributable to an 8.5% shipment per workday increase, partially offset by a 0.8% decrease in our average weight per shipment. Length of haul decreased modestly. Shifting to the expense side for a few key items to note in the quarter. Salaries, wages, and benefits increased 15.5%, which is primarily driven by a combination of our employee headcount growth of, of approximately to 13% year over year and the results of our July 2024 wage increase, which averaged approximately 4.1%. The growth in headcount is related to the increase in volume compared to prior year, as well as the opening of 18 new facilities opened in the past 12 months. In addition, other employee related costs increased, including additional training for onboarded team members and unfavorable development of workers' compensation claims. Purchase transportation expense, including both non-asset truckload volume and LTL purchase transportation miles, decreased by 14.5% compared to the third quarter last year, and with 7.8% of total revenue compared to 9.9% in the third quarter of 2023. Truck and rail PT miles combined were 14.2% of our total line haul miles in the quarter. Fuel expense decreased by 1.3% in the quarter, while company line haul miles increased 12.1%. The decrease in fuel expense was primarily the result of national average diesel prices decreasing by over 13% on a year-over-year -year basis. Claims and insurance expense increased by 6.9% year-over-year and was up 2% or 0.4 million sequentially from the second quarter of 2024. The increase compared to the third quarter of 2023 was primarily due to increased claims activity and development of open cases. Depreciation expense of 54.7 million in the quarter was 19.8% higher year over year, primarily due to ongoing investments in revenue equipment, real estate, and technology. Compared to the third quarter of 2023, cost per shipment increased 0.6%, despite the headwinds from the wage increase and the costs associated with new terminal openings. We are pleased with the continued cost management and execution from our team in a challenging environment. Total operating expenses increased by 10.9% in the quarter, and with the year over year revenue increase of 8.6%, our operating ratio deteriorated to 85.1% compared to 83.4% a year ago. Our tax rate for the quarter was 24.4% compared to 24.6% in the third quarter last year. And our diluted earnings per share were $3.46 compared to $3.67 in the third quarter a year ago. I will turn the call, now turn the call back over to Fritz for some closing comments. Thanks, Matt. As we continue to celebrate our 100th year in business, I'm pleased with our ability to demonstrate our customer first approach to both new and existing customers in our recently opened terminals and across our network. Every new terminal opening is an opportunity to better position ourselves to provide additional value to our customers. While opening 11 new terminals in a quarter is a large undertaking, these investments are critical to creating long-term value for both our customers and shareholders. Having a, compar a comparable footprint to our peers is critical to our value proposition, and full national coverage allows us to offer solutions in every market. While the macroeconomic backdrop remains uncertain, we believe our operating trends support the can continued execution of our long-term growth strategy. Earlier this week, we, opened our, we welcomed our team members in Akron, Ohio, and we plan to open three additional terminals the remainder of the year. These openings will result in 21 new openings for the year, by far a record in our company's history. 
As we continue to invest in our network and expand our footprint to better serve our customers, we still anticipate capital expenditures for 2024 to be approximately $1 billion. We remain focused on measuring our performance for customers and onboarding team members that will reinforce our 100-year culture as we continue to execute our growth strategy. For the last year, we've been intently focused on building our national platform. With the culmination of 2024 investments and openings, we believe that we'll have positioned the company for long-term growth across all geographies. And we have stressed from the outset of this process, we approach these opportunities with a singular focus on the long-term prospects of this business. These investments were never about the current quarter, the next quarter, or frankly, next year, but an opportunity to transform our footprint and market positioning into the future. In the next year, we will focus on continuing to develop our new markets by introducing new customers to our service and continue to expand and support the success of current customers. We'll continue to invest in equipment, technology, and facility enhancements or relocations to support this value proposition. Because we've opened these facilities with a focus on the long term, we only have, we've only begun to start capturing the value of these investments. As the LTL market develops, there will be opportunities for us to supplement our network with additional facilities. In the nearer term, we see great value and potential in the footprint that we have developed. We're now ready to open the line for questions, operator. Thank you. And we will now begin the question and answer session. If you have dialed in and would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad to raise your hand and join the queue. If you would like to withdraw your question, simply press star 1 a second time. If you are called upon to ask your question and are listening via speakerphone on your device, please pick up your handset and ensure that your phone is not on mute when asking your question. To be able to take as many questions as possible, we do ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Again, it is star one if you would like to join the queue. And your first question comes from the line of Ken Hexter with Bank of America. Your line is open. Hey, great, uh, and, and great to see the uh, the contract renewal is over 7%, um, so great quarter. So Fritz, um, or, or uh, Matt, can you talk about the sequential growth in October? It looked like maybe tons and even weight per shipment, uh, revenue punch rate, looked like, uh, based on the numbers, started to accelerate at, at the end of September, uh, at the end of the quarter. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, September, October, are shape, or October shaping up? And then, Matt, did you mention a one-timer in workers' comp? Is that something you can put a scale on? Hey, Ken. Um, I'll go ahead and give the monthly numbers just, just so you have them. So, in July, shipments per workday up 10.6%, tonnage per day up 5%. August, shipments up 7%, tonnage up 8.2%. September, shipments up 8.6%, tonnage up 10.1%. And October to, October to date, shipments up about 4%, tonnage up about 6.5%. And keep in mind, in October, I mean, we're comping a period where up here had a cyber issue, um, you know, plus there was a hurricane in the in the early part of October as well. So comps are a little bit strange month to date, um, just in that number as well. But in terms of September, I mean, it's, you know, we're starting to lap the yellow period at this point in the industry disruption. So, you know, it, it moves around a little bit in Q3 based on when that really started happening in the back half of, of July. So that plays into it. But we're also opening a lot of new facilities and we we are expanding our addressable market and should be seeing that. So we feel good about our, our progress there. And then in terms of work comp, nothing one-off, just just part of the business development of those open claims and things like that. So nothing to call out there. Greater headcount. That's right. And, and just to wrap that up, the, the um, tons, uh, ton, uh, weight per shipment, sorry, that, that also accelerated in September, right? Um, yeah, just with those shipments and tonnage numbers, it, a little bit at the back. But I mean, it's it's modest, right? Those we've modest, talked about okay. it before. Mix can move around a little bit. So, at any given period, based on what you're handling for customers, it can move around a little bit. All right, appreciate that. And I guess my follow-up would just be on on um, the environment. Uh, you talked about Fritz. You mentioned the mix. You kind of felt like it was done last quarter. How do you feel? I guess at this stage, now that you've got all these new facilities ramped up. Uh, are, are you? You mentioned last quarter you thought it was done, but now you're talking about a little industrial overhang. 
Uh, is the market stabilizing out there, you know, in terms of, you know, if you look outside of the new facility development? You know, Ken, the way I would, the way I would think about it is it's, it's probably somewhat comparable uh, Q2 to Q3. Um, you know, it's bounced around a little bit. Um, I, I don't think it's um, – I don't think it's markedly better or worse. So it's it's just there's a little bit of noise in there. I think as you open up new facilities, you you do have um, you know typically that that the new volume typically looks like the rest of the portfolio, if you will. So we haven't really seen an impact one way or another there. Wonderful. Appreciate the thought. Thanks, guys. Thanks. And your next question comes from the line of Jordan Alger with. Goldman Sachs, your line is open. Yeah, hi. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the um, the, the, the revenue per hundred weight X fuel. It was up the 1.7 percent. I know you touched a little bit on mix and price, but you know maybe talk a little bit more about that and and perhaps how that yield trended uh, through the quarter and how we could think about it looking into the next quarter, the fourth quarter. Thank you. Well. Again, I mean, mix impacts that a little bit. So, you know, we look, we typically look more at revenue per bill rather than the yield just because the mix has an impact on that. But we feel good about where we stand. I mean, we, our contractual renewals number where it is continues to remain strong and freight moves around a little bit when you take a rate increase at times. And with the macro backdrop where it is, there's customers that may go find other other options. And um, we're willing to let that walk. We're not going to go chase that. So it's going to come back to us. So we feel when the environment needs it and when the, you know, when the customer needs good quality of service. So we feel good about that. And the other thing is we put a GRI in earlier this week at a rate of 7.9%. So we continue to remain focused on mixed management and making sure that we're getting the margins on what we expect from customers. So our focus has not changed on that. It's, it's heightened the GRI earlier this year than it was last year. And we feel really good about our marketing position, our market position, and our addressable market. That we put that into place a little bit earlier than in the past. And I guess just just sort of is there a way to think about how the yields, however way you look at it, could could shape up as we go from the third quarter to the fourth quarter? Thanks. Well, again, mix is going to impact that a little bit depending on on what happens. Our view of the industrial backdrop, we're not seeing any anything on our crystal ball that, we, that tells us that Q4 is going to all of a sudden turn and get better. If it does, great. But we really remain focused on the same thing. We put the, like I said, we put the GRI in place. Whenever we do that, there's a little bit of shipment shifting uh, in the periods that follow. So we'll experience a little bit of that. But uh, we remain focused on making sure that through contractual renewals, through discussions with customers, we're focused and committed to, to driving price. We know that's our opportunity. Thank you. And your next question comes from the line of Daniel Imbro with Stevens. Your line is open. Yeah, hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking our questions. Morning, yeah, maybe I'll start on a shorter focus one, just following up on the October discussion. Can you remind us what maybe normal seasonality is from an OR standpoint from 3Q to 4Q? And, and then maybe given the improving weight for shipment, just the tonnage growth, how do you see this year shaping up versus that normal range? Sure. So what we try to do with this is look back at, at recent history and do our best to find some, some comparable periods. So if you look at that um, over the, the past handful of years, the sequential degradations right around 250 basis points on average. Um, there's obviously some years on either side of that, but that's the average if you look at, at some of the more recent periods. But with the momentum we have now and, and what we feel like from a customer acceptance standpoint with our, our new markets and our expansion, we feel like we should be able to beat that. And uh, we, that's, that's kind of where we're targeting at this point. Oh, super helpful. And, and then maybe for stepping back a little bit, you know, think about 2025. So this year's clearly been pressured by startup costs. It sounds like execution is going well there with the new terminals. How should we think about, or should we think about expense growth moderating in 25, a terminal growth moderates so that these actually become good guys for incremental margins, or or what's the right way to think about incremental margins into 2025 as we start to lap really a couple of years of elevated investments across the network? Yeah, I, th I mean there are a couple of elements to that. Um, so I, you know, we're not we're not going to open have an opening year uh, of 21 facilities like we are this year 
any time in my too distant future. I just uh, that, that was a lot for us to take on, but we also looked at it and said this is significant opportunity. We've got to, we've got to take advantage of it, and, and and we have. You know, I think as we look into next year, what you'll see is now we're a much materially bigger company than we were a few years ago. So the level of ongoing sort of maintenance capital and sort of thing is going to have to hey, the fleet's bigger, the the bigger facility footprint, that sort of thing to maintain those assets. Um, you won't see the openings next year. I mean, maybe there's a small handful, you know, five, six, something like that, depending on uh, what the environment looks like. Um, you'll see us relocate, relocate facilities next year. Um, those, we view those as sort of negligible costs because you, you generally, the ones you have to relocate are ones that, you know, maybe you've, you've stretched capacity or filled capacity, so you're moving to something that's got a little bit more operating flexibility. So I, I, what we really, really like is we're going to exit this year with 214 well-positioned facilities across the country that are positioned to really drive value for our customers. And when that happens, that gives us the opportunity to really drive value in our business. And I, I think that that's we made the investments this year with an eye to long-term value creation, and I think that that's we kind of spend a more of a value creating mindset. Um, not that the investments weren't value creating; they they absolutely were. But in the short term, you, investments require that you know that there's a cost. Those things aren't free. Opening 21 terminals are not free. Now, when you monetize those, you expect to provide great service to a customer, and when you do that, you you know you look to get paid for it and that's where the return comes, and uh, we're really excited about what the ones that we open, the facilities we open just in the second quarter. I mean, they're profitable already. Now, they're not at the company average, which says they've got runway, and those are great assets, and it's a great that we we open those. So I think as we look into next year, it becomes more of a, you know, kind of let's capture the value of the facilities. Now, we, you know, if we get a stronger freight, uh, uh, freight backdrop next year, I think we can really accelerate as well. So I, I'm, I'm excited about the prospects. I, the, we did these things, we made these invest, investments with a purpose, and, uh, and now's the time to really capture the value of that. Thanks so much. And your next question comes from the line of Tom Wadowitz with UBS. Your line is open. Uh, yeah, good morning. Um, wanted to, I, I know you, you offered some maybe high level, um, uh, yeah, I guess thinking about uh, now 25 or kind of the, you know, with the new terminals, what you're going to do, focus on uh, value or may, maybe focus on uh, margin, that sounds like a little bit. Um, how do you think about, uh, Fritz, the potential for margin improvement if the macro, in 2025, if the macro is stable, right? Like, it'd be great to have some cycle help, but, you know, it seems like with you know, your traction with customers, you'll improve utilization of terminals that were open second quarter, third quarter. Um, you know, your contractual renewals sound quite strong, maybe mix is stable. So uh, just any thoughts about, can you get the normal 100 to 150 bips of improvement uh, if you don't get help from macro in 25? So, yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, listen, I this is, uh, opportunity for us to get back on our sort of normal cadences. And let me be really clear, I, I think I used the word value. Um, I think a 214 terminal network across the country that's providing a very high level of service shouldn't be a value. There's a pay for, uh, there's a, uh, people are paying for service in that case. And I think we're in a position we can do that. And I think in a, you know, kind of an environment that is sort of tepid, neutral, however you want to call it. I think we're in a position where we can expand OR in the next year. Uh, I think what's really exciting is if you get in a more positive, stronger environment, I think the business scales. I love the idea of scaling some of these facilities that we have just opened. Um, you know, we have never been about um, uh, growth for growth's sake. We have been about let's get the addressable market right because we think we can provide something to customers. And when we do that, we have the opportunity Drive, drive returns in the business. And I think next year is the beginning of that, right? And I, I don't see an impediment for us um, in the next year. You know, if we get a reasonable uh, environment, I think we're in a position we can grow the OR. And I think, you know, the range you provided, or 100, 150, yeah, I mean, is that, that's in scope for sure. Um, could it be better than that? We know how, I mean, if you look back in history, when the uh, 
tighter environment or an environment where there's more macroeconomic growth, you know what SIO will do. And I, I think that, that that's, we execute that playbook. That's how we operate. Okay. Um, and then for the second question, how do we think about the levers on mix? I guess if I go pre your big expansion of, uh, you know, the terminals, it seemed like you, you know, pretty consistently focused on improving weight per shipment and mix, and that was part of the margin improvement equation. Is that something you can fairly quickly uh, address and, you know, kind of go back to that in, say, first quarter, second quarter next year, or does that take longer? Just because, you know, recognizing that the mix has changed a lot as you brought on, you know, more retail freight and more, you know, more terminals. You know, Tom, what I would say is, first and foremost, um, we've got to really continue to focus on pricing, in which we have been. You look at our contractual renewals, you look at the GRI we had on Monday, we're, we're not uh, giving up on pricing. There's, it, it all's got to get, if we get the, the business to where we want it to be, everything, the rates have got to go up across the board and all, all elements of the business. Um, I think that what we continue to do, though, is that we continue to look for customers market opportunities where somebody says, hey, we really, we, we appreciate the value we get from SIA in terms of this high level of service, the reach of this national network now. We can now, uh, you know, ship more of our wallet with SIA because we don't have to worry about them handing off freight in markets. We can look at it and say SIA can go to all these 214 facilities. So I think that, that that's an opportunity for us to continue to, to, to reinforce that with customers. And I think that you get in the equation where you know we're you know we get the appropriate pricing in place, um, and you know that'll find, we'll find customers that find great value or opportunity in, in the assets that we have, and that's a way for us to improve mix over time. How, how much of the freight were you handing off? Just to understand that part of that comment previously. I mean, was, we haven't given a, a percent out. I mean, and those markets aren't necessarily. The, the largest one, but it's, I mean, it's impactful, right? Not, we think about it as a opportunity to improve that portion of it, certainly, but more importantly, we can offer direct service in those markets. And we know that our customers want us to handle it all the way through. And that's very important to us in making sure that we can address that. And that's big. That's why we push those facilities and open them in, in the period. So, and then I think in terms of the mix, too, keep in mind, every new terminal opening is an opportunity to speak with our existing customers about what we do for them. So it's an opportunity to talk about business that we may not have had an opportunity to, to get a shot at in the past because we couldn't handle it direct in and out of those markets. And now we can at, at full nationwide coverage. So you may not necessarily get that the next day when you open, but when we get the opportunity to share with our customers that we can provide a solution for everything, that's impactful. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. And your next question comes from Fadi Shamoon with BMO Capital Markets. Your line is open. Yeah, good morning. Um, so thank you for taking my question. So in the last couple of quarters, you've outperformed your kind of thought 10-year average in terms of shipment per day by maybe 200, 250 beef sets quarter over quarter, just looking at it. I mean, if we apply the same principle going into Q4, that would put you in the high single digit kind of shipment uh, shipment per day. Um, just want to kind of test this assumption. How do you feel about it? Yeah, I, th I think, Fadi, it's um, what, I, what I would offer is that, um, you know, we know we get a little bit of shipment disruption that comes uh, with well, we, anytime we do a, a GRI, um, you know, you see a little bit of movement around there. Um, this quarter, you know, we started the quarter, the comp the last year, we mentioned that we saw a bit of, you know, a little bit of a challenging comp because of what we saw ha happen with the peer a year ago. So that that's a, kind of another sort of factor in there. Um, and then we started the quarter kind of dealing with the remnants of a hurricane and another hurricane. So I think all those things create a fair amount of noise. Um, around sort of shipments into the quarter and not to mention that it's a seasonal quarter meaning that you know holidays come into play um, i think what's important though is that over time and i think you start to see it with uh with our shipment growth uh, our 
revenue and bigger part of the pie. And so our history um, is, uh, it, it's changing, if you will. Um, so it's, you know, we've got a different sort of baseline. And uh, so I, I'm excited about it. I think we continue to grow through this. Okay. Um, okay. Just just going back to the OR, uh, see the naughty question. Body, are you still on the call? Yes. We got dropped. Hello, operator. Yes, we are still connected. Can you hear me? Jesus Christ. I'm I'm on the line. Can you hear me? And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will pause for just a moment while we try to reconnect our speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. We are now reconnected with our speakers. Hi, can you hear me now? Hey, hey bye. We can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear us? Okay. Yes, yes, we can. Thanks. So, all right. So, did, um, what part of the what part of the question did we drop off? Um, I heard I heard your entire answer, so I think we're fine from at least my okay. perspective. So did you, uh, my did follow up was third part did you hear the part about how disappointed we were that the phone wasn't working? <laughs> yes, we heard that too. All right, perfect. So, so that'll go to, that'll go down in history as a kind of a great moment there. All right, got it. <laughs> um so yeah, I, I, you know, you you you're gonna give us perspective on the volume side, but I mean, you know, I think it feels like there's no reason for you to continue to kind of build that momentum with the new terminal opening, uh, which could put your shipments kind of quarter over quarter at a pretty solid pace. Um, and, and and with that perspective, I'm just wondering that why wouldn't the operating ratio seasonality kind of follow a little bit closer to the shipment seasonality, given that your startup cost is kind of in the rear view mirror at this point and you know, we should start to see that operating leverage beginning in Q4. I just wanted to see if we can uh, narrow this, the, the, the um, you know, the range or this thinking about what, what, what OR could look like in the fourth quarter. Well, hey, Fadi. Um, sorry for the, the connectivity issues. Uh, I mean, look, you always, it's Q4, right? It's a seasonally slower period. There's always the, the challenges associated with that. Uh, but we're not, we still have openings in this quarter, right? I mean, they're they're not as in terms of magnitude, they're not as big as what what was you know the count that was done in Q3. But we still have openings associated with with the fourth quarter, so those aren't zero. Now, the, like Fritz said earlier in his commentary, we've got as we continue to move past you know further from the openings, like we did from Q2 to Q3, those get better. So uh, we we still have the fourth quarter challenges and customer closures and things like that that are just normal for the fourth quarter, but 
we do have openings that are still going to be embedded into the costs in, in Q4. They're they're still there. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. And your next question comes from the line of Brian Austinbeck with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking the question. Hey, Brian. I wanted to um, ask about the the Mass Geo survey that just came out. Um, obviously, there's a little bit of a, um, a backslide in some of the performance on a relative basis, but I think it was done through June through September timeframe, so clearly a lot of startups that were going on there. So. Uh, it's just one data point. Obviously, you look at service and everything internally pretty well, but it's one that we can all see from the outside. So just want to get your perspective on uh, what the most recent results mean from your from your vantage point. So good question, Brian. So uh, a couple things. I would say that uh, if you look at the Mastio data in total for the industry, so the entire industry got better uh, in terms of kind of performance for the customer, uh, which I think for the customer base, that, that's a that's a total positive. Um, I think if you look at uh, how, what industry growth looked like, um, you know, kind of across the board, you look at the public competitors and we see uh, declining sort of shipments and tonnage across the space, except for SIA. Um, so we've taken on a larger uh, percentage or larger part of the industry. We have uh, Grown in new markets, uh, as we noted, we'll, by the end of the year, we'll have 21 openings. So that means new customers, new experiences, new demands, uh, adjustments to customers. Um, and throughout that, we've had to hire, you know, probably, uh, you know, somewhere around 1,500, 2,000 new employees over the last year or so to, to support all that. So. Uh, what it says is that, you know, we that, that was a challenging environment in which we operated in. Um, I can tell you across the board internally, when we look at the data, we go through it and we say, all right, we've got some in here that are positive. And as we further analyze the data, we'll, we distill that down to our region and our terminal locations, and then we, we work at it. Um, and we say, listen, it's got to get, we're going to keep getting better. We're going to keep uh, our focus on that and not lose sight of the prize. Our internal metrics have, have trended favorably, um, but you know what? It, listen, the feedback like that says that we just got to keep doubling down. I think that is, as we continue to develop experience with the customer set and new markets, um, you know, I think we'll be in a position where they come to and expect and understand what, you know, the, the great service they get from SI. I uh, appreciate that perspective, Fritz. Um, quick follow-up for you, Matt. In terms of, it might be difficult to tell, but obviously the hurricane was pretty disruptive for a lot of transportation networks and some of your customers. So is that part of the, the noise that you feel like you're seeing in October? Maybe it's a little bit too hard to tell, but do you feel like there's at least a maybe a little bit of a catch-up that you might see throughout the rest of this month as some of this uh, you know, gets behind and recovery efforts start to, to pick up speed a little bit? Well, I mean, thankfully, we haven't had any impact to our people or or terminals or you know major issues but there absolutely is an impact in that month to date right i mean you have a pretty big storm that rolls across the, the southeast geography the, those are pretty big markets for us and make up a good a good chunk of our revenue so there is an impact in there one of the things that we see is that sometimes that volume doesn't always come back it, it's you're really dependent on on order flow at times and Really, we may be operational, but some customers may still be closed. So you, you face that a little bit. So things are coming back online, certainly, and we saw that in, in the week or so after that. So it is in the October month to date numbers, but um, you know, just part of the challenge in the business. But you, you don't always get all of that back just based on on patterns and and different order flow. Yeah, I, I think you got to keep in mind that um, the the sort of Florida, Georgia, Carolinas, that's becoming a bigger and bigger part of SIA's business, uh, reflecting investments we've made in the last few years. And, uh, you know, having lean and land right on the end of a quarter, that uh, that certainly had an impact on the third quarter result. Uh, then you have that, you know, you start to recover, and then you get another hurricane the following week. So, yeah, that, that's been part of the noise we deal with. And we, you know, that's part of the business that we're in. And, you know, we have to be able to flex and adjust to it, but it's certainly, uh, 
you know, it, it did have an impact in the third and, and you know, early parts of this quarter. Okay. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it. And your next question comes from the line of Eric Morgan with Barclays. Your line is open. Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, I wanted to follow up on pricing. Um, you know, you've had at least a few quarters now with those high single-digit contract reno uh, renewals. Obviously, the 7.5% uh, GRI last year, I think almost 8% this year. So um, if mix doesn't move around too much su substantially from here, should we start to be seeing some of these types of increases in your realized yields as we get into 2025 um, at some point? Or you know, what are some of the other variables we should be considering as we think about uh, modeling that? Well, I appreciate the question, Erica. As you know, the biggest one of the biggest challenges in our industry is that contracts, there's really no volume commitment. So we have to always make sure that we're getting what we expect from from customers. And in the environment where we are now, you know shippers have options, and they may move things around or try someone different in a period like this, and we're not we're not going to chase that. But, all else equal, we're, we're putting rates in at the level that we expect. And uh, when the macro gets a little bit better, that should certainly help. And we expect to, to push that forward. It's not always linear, but it's an opportunity for us to put the rates that we need in front of our customer. And our, our sales team is doing a great job negotiating those and, and speaking to the customers about the value we provide. The other thing that should continue to help us support that is at a national footprint. We can do more and more for customers than we have ever been able to do and with a larger addressable market, it should allow us to gain larger share of wallet and mix up with customers where that's the, the opportunity around that. So we feel good about what we've, we've been putting in and in a soft backdrop, we're, we're confident that uh, we'll, we'll realize some of those gains. Appreciate that. And maybe just a quick follow up on uh, the CapEx discussion. Um, I think you've mentioned some normalization next year after you know the bigger year this year. Any early thoughts on where that could land in 2025 and kind of what the big buckets would be? Appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're still working to finalize what that number looks like. But if you think about the number this year, less the one-time transaction at the beginning of the year, I think that's probably a fair range to start with. It, it, the business is bigger now, so that, that CapEx number is going to stay elevated. We've, we've got to support the teams with equipment, and there continues to be real estate investments. But I think if you if you normalize for that, big transaction at the beginning of the year. That's a that's a fair range to start with. Great, thanks a lot. And your next question comes from the line of Jonathan Chappelle with Evercore ISI. Your line is open. Thank you, good morning. Um, Fritz, you called out specifically, you were pleased with the terminals you opened in second quarter. So as we think about uh, the seasoning of these terminals and as you have a full quarter of implementation, is there any way to kind of frame out what the utilization of the terminals that you opened up in the first half of the year look like relative to these 11 that you opened in, in the third quarter to help us kind of frame out when those can get to a level where you feel is closer to full utilization? Yeah, I, I, it's probably going to be a few years before full utilization because of, as we've described before is that we don't make an investment with the idea that we got to fill it up on Monday, right? So we make an investment with the idea that we have you know, it's a few year runway to support the market. Um, the facilities we opened up in the second quarter were a much larger scale than the facilities that we opened up in the third quarter. So uh, to compare, to try to compare what um, a fantastic facility in Butte, Montana looks like to a facility in Laredo, Texas, or Garland, Texas, or Trenton is really not, um, it's sort of apples and oranges. They have different roles in the network. Um, so I, th I think what we would point to is that as we continue to focus on, you know, further finding the customers that match our are interested in what we have to offer, um, and we continue will grow in those ways. I think that the the big facilities that we open, where I'm really pleased about, and that's a uh, shouldn't be uh, overlooked, is the fact that you know within a, uh, a quarter we have them all contributing from an operating income perspective that that's a big deal that's why you make investments that um in a in a challenging environment so we put those in place i think they'll continue to improve from here now you're in the seasonally uh lower time so you probably aren't going to have see the same level of improvements for those facilities into the fourth quarter uh, the facilities that we uh open in the great plains uh 
we're really excited about those because I think that really enhances the value proposition for our customers when they know that when they when Cy picks up freight, it's going all the way to the destination. So those over time, over time will have an important complementary role to the overall network business, and it'll be certainly a big part of creating a lot of value for our customers. And keep in mind, too, John, that those, that's a brand new geography for us, right? Entering a new geography mm-hmm. is very different than putting a, a second facility in a in a Garland, Texas area where we've been. So, it, like Fritz said, it's not it's not overnight, and we don't design them to be overnight. But it, that's a different animal in terms of brand recognition and sharing with customers that we're in a completely new geography. So they're all a little bit different. Right. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, Matt, just a quick one for you. I know it's minutia. Um, and I know the fuel is a pass through, but your fuel surcharge revenue was almost flat quarter over quarter, despite fuel dropping. You mentioned that diesel prices are down 13% year over year. Fuel surcharge revenue is down less than 5% year over year. Some of your peers have already reported had much bigger step downs post sequentially in year over year. Do you just have like a better surcharge mechanism, or is there some lag where this decline in fuel prices that we've seen, you know, basically over the last couple of months kind of catches up in the fourth year? Well, Fuel is not a pass-through. Uh, I mean, we we invest. <laughs> every part of this business is inflationary, and we expect to make a return on every part of it. So, um, but I mean, the fuel surcharge mechanism is is similar to to what's out there for other LTLs. But the mix of business does have an impact. And, and keep in mind, when it's a percentage of revenue, so when we're raising rates on customers, we have an opportunity to get more from a fuel surcharge standpoint. So. Uh, I mean, I, I think one thing to think about in terms of us, we, our our volumes are up, right, compared to some some others. So that, that plays into it as well. But nothing to comment on there. We don't we haven't put anything in different on on the fuel side. Okay, I got it. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Fred. And to our next question comes from the line of Chris Weatherby with Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Hey, thanks. Good morning, guys. Um, if Fritz, I think on the last call you mentioned that facilities open in the last three years kind of were operating at about a 95 OR. Um, you know, you, you talked about two Q facility openings turning positive in the third quarter. I guess I'm just kind of curious as you think about that metric that you gave last quarter, does it change at all? I know it's only a quarter, but I'm kind of curious if you feel like you're making more or less progress relative to, you know, what you have seen in the past, just given – the sort of density that you're adding to the network, these new regions and creating this sort of 48 state contiguous network. Yeah, you know, we're real pleased with what we're seeing. I think the uh, the, the key thing in this and why it can, it can vary a little bit, I, I mentioned it in the last question, is that terminal openings can have different sort of roles, right? Some uh, facility might provide a really high, high level solution for a, a customer in the end of the line, right? So those facilities, are going to take a much longer time to kind of get the company average OR or, or uh, be a, a big contributor. Um, so those, so some of those that we've opened uh, historically have been in that sort of met that definition, and certainly the ones we opened in the third quarter kind of met that definition. Uh, what's really exciting about the second quarter facilities, and frankly all of them, is they're making progress. The second quarter ones our big ones. And those are some of the bigger investments we made uh, around purchasing assets. Um, And it's real nice to see those progress, see them scale in big freight markets, um, and then see them being part of making those end of the line facilities continue to be a value creator as well. I mean, if I, you know, the great thing is, is that those great plains states, there's a customer that's bringing freight in from uh, Mexico into Laredo, and we've got a shot now to go direct from Laredo to all the cover Montana and Dakotas. And those are really nice value enhancing uh, opportunities for the customer. And and as you cobble together a network, you know, Laredo is going to scale faster because it's a big facility, but then you're going to get the value out of those smaller facilities because you're, you're in a position, you can do a great job for the customer in those markets. Uh, we couldn't do that before. I mean, we had customers before that said, hey, Cy, you're fantastic, but we understand you hand off freight into those markets. And once you get that solved, we'll, we're with you. Well, they're with us now, right? And so I think that that's the, the, because of that sort of dynamic, when you look at the trend over time, the ones in the second quarter have a bigger impact now because they're larger. But the great thing is the progress of all of them over time, over the last couple of years, it's really exciting to see. And that 
that will play itself out over the next year years uh, as we continue to, to develop the network. Okay, that's helpful. And then you know, towards the end of your prepared remarks, you know, you, you're talking about the network and what you have now, and, and maybe how that looks over the course of the next, you know, year or two as you let that kind of grow and, and build out. I guess I'm curious, you know, there's still going to be more assets available. Presumably, most of these, if not all of these, were sort of reviewed during the th first process through the yellow auction. I'm just kind of curious how you think about that. Is that something that has interest to you, or what you have right now for the next, you know, 12, 18 months is kind of what you need? So I think as I look at the at the 214 that we have in place right now, or by the end of the year we'll have in place, the, particularly the, the 21 we opened this year, there was a really compelling business case around all of those. And so we're excited about that. The ones that will relocate into next year have similar sort of compelling things. But one of the things that we have to be very mindful of in this business is that over time, there will be places that we have the opportunity to enhance the network that we're in. Um, and as these assets trade in the market, um, you know, we'll be a participant in that. We won't be in a participant in it at the level that we just were, but, you know, sort of the onesie twosies and two or three here and there, um, or, you know, down the, a couple of years from now, maybe there's a year that's five or six or something like that. I think we're, we're positioned to be able to do that. Um, there are markets that even today we're, we're thrilled with the map we have, but we also see opportunities. Um, but it, as we think about it as a business today, there's a lot of value to create out of the facilities we're going to exit this year with. And then there'll be some that we can add on. We like the idea of, um, you know, participating in a secondary market around these uh, facilities as they may or may not become available. Um, you know, I think that that's a long-term opportunity. We've proven, if you go back to 2017, we've proven we know how to organically grow. So, you know, and we're opportunistic around the real estate. I mean, even look at the ones that we've opened up this year. There are ones that we opened up that didn't come through the yellow auction process. They were in our pipeline, and there'll be others like that down the road. Okay, that's helpful. Appreciate the time this morning. Thanks, guys. And your next question comes from Jason Seidel with TD Cowan. Your line is open. Thanks, operator. Uh, morning, gentlemen. Um, I want to go back a little bit to October to sort of better understand how I should look at 4Q tonnage. You know, if, if, we, if we push the hurricane impacts aside early on in October and we take away the impacts of the cyber attack on one of your competitors last year, is, is this 6.5 look closer to double digits? I, I don't know that I would go there. Um, you know, I think, Jason, what I would focus on is kind of our commitment and focus on uh, driving results out of this business. So we're not in it to see to try to lead the league in growth. Um, we're here to – we've got a footprint that we're trying to expand. The volume will come. We're not chasing volume. So, um, yeah, there's disruption that's in there that is, um, you know, had an impact on results. Sometimes it's interesting when you have weather events. Sometimes you just don't see the you don't see the volume again, so it um, you know it, it's uh, it's kind of how it goes. Uh, we'll, we're focused on you know continue to to uh, deliver for the customer, and we're we're going to get our share out of that. And the openings that we've got, they're they're organically going to contribute. I mean, if you look at at sort of the growth that we've had uh, this year, more and more of it is coming from facilities we've just opened in the last three years. I mean, it's becoming a material part of the business, and we're not. We're not in it to chase volume, right? It's just, hey, Sia's here. We know what we get from Sia, so we're going to do business with Sia. That's where the growth's coming from. So we're not um, – I'm, I'm not in a position to really to comment on what it could have been. I just know what it was. Fair enough. Um, also, you, you guys made comments about potentially expanding some of the terminals uh, that you've opened up over the past 12 months, maybe next year. What type of a market would we have to see to make you want to expand uh, one of your recent additions? Yeah, sometimes what you do is you, like, we, we've got one facility that we've purchased um, and opened uh, this year. And you know what? We, we, are, we see near-end runway around that, that terminal that we just needed to expand it to create an efficiency, make sure that we've got the appropriate amount of flexibility in the facility. Um, we're not when we when we expand a facility, we're not we're not thinking about next week's volume. We're we're thinking about all right, how do we make sure we provide a very high level of service, and then over the next number of years, 
uh, we've got ample capacity to maintain a very consistent level of service to the customer. So, uh, you know, we'll, uh, as we get, you know, choke points in the network, we absolutely will add expand capacity or maybe even relocate a facility. But um, that's kind of how we think about it. Appreciate the color, gentlemen. And your next question comes from the line of Ari Rosa with Citigroup. Your line is open. Hi, great. Uh, this is Ben Moore uh, on uh, for Ari at, at City uh, uh, Fritz and Matt. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Uh, your yield growth, uh, maybe going back to, to pricing dis discussion, has been uh, on a fantastic trend the last several years. And then the Mass Deal study confirms your successfully taking pricing increases, especially this year versus last year, how much would that be a function, would you say, of your pricing gains catching up to your service that's improved over the last 10 years? That's been something, part of your narrative the last couple of years. And then conversely, how much uh, of that is a function of being able to provide uh, a bigger reach of your network that you mentioned from your new terminal openings over the last few quarters? But I, I think it's it's frankly it's it's all of the above to, to to be honest with you. I wish I could break it out, but what I would tell you is part of the compelling part of why you open 21 facilities is you're focused on the long term, number one, and you're focused on the idea that if you can repeat that level of service for customers that are are satisfied with you, you've got a shot to organically grow into that network um, and continue to repeat service for customers and our. You know, we've, we've proven we know how to do that. And when that happens, the, we're in a best, better position to be able to say, listen, in order for us to continue to make the level of investments in this business, uh, we approach the customers and they understand that, hey, they're getting a lot of value from SIA and, and we're in a position where we continue to focus on making sure that we're appropriately compensated for the level of investment. So I mean, this year we're going to spend a billion dollars on the company, right? And that that deserves a return. Customers get a return. We're going to focus on getting a return. So that becomes part of our pricing thesis. That only works if we've got the appropriate reach in the markets for customers, and we continue to replicate that service. Great. Thanks for the color there. And maybe as a follow-up, uh, sticking with the, the study, going the, the other direction on, on your service, um, uh, you know, it, we uh, you, you've seen it uh, decline a bit. Uh, how much would you say – uh, the year of your decline in service, uh, which, uh, you know, it seems to be from your new terminal openings, um, how much of that is from not yet building up a large enough customer base? Uh, and then how much of that do you think is from just a temporary decline in, you know, say damage, on-time pickups, deliveries, just as normal growing pains, and it's temporary and will be out of that phase in the next few quarters? Listen, I, at the SIA internally, uh, as we typically what we do with that Massio data or the, the, the survey data is we disaggregate that and we spend a lot of time figuring out how we get that on the trend, which we want to be. We want to be best in, best in the business, right? And that's our focus. That's our commitment. You know, in the last year, we've grown this footprint substantially. Um, we know that in a situation where your business is contracting or, or you're, you're dealing with less volume with a customer, it, it's an opportunity to really enhance your service. Um, you can certainly uh, deliver you know, high-level remarks when your, your network is not stressed. Uh, we've grown faster than anybody else in the business. We've taken on more customers uh, than anyone else in the business, I would, I would guess. Uh, certainly, uh, we're representative, represented in that survey more than we've ever been, and that's a reflection of a growing footprint, um, more customers, more touches. Um, we got 1,500 to 2,000 new employees that we've added over the last net add over the last uh, year year and a half to to support that. Um, we got to make sure those folks are all understand that at SIA, this is how we do it. And uh, for the folks that have been here for a longer period of time, it's a recommitment to saying, hey, listen, this is what makes us different. This is why we're outgrowing the industry. And we'll, uh, we'll disaggregate that data. Our, our teams across the network uh, will be very, very focused on how do we get that back on a positive track. I'd point out that the industry in total got better. And, yeah, our marks in some cases relatively got you know, fell a bit, um, but I also think that I look at this is really a long game. This isn't about 
what's happened here in the last few months or even you know last year. It's, this is all about the long game. Great. I uh, appreciate the time and insights as always. And your next question comes from the line of Robbie Shanker with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Uh, thanks. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, just to follow up on the mask here, there kind of seems like you have more details than we do on, on the data here. Uh, do you have numbers on same store customers uh, ranking versus new customers? And that'll like make it very clear that it's, it's the new terminals that are the issue here, and that will take time to ramp up. Uh, and also, how much does something like this uh, influence the pricing discussion of the customer? Like, is this something that you know, just Wall Street's focused on, or kind of how much of a commercial impact does this have? Yeah, sorry, I, I don't have the level of detail you're looking for. Um, we certainly disaggregate the data and spend a lot of time looking at it. I, I don't know that we have that specific car out. Um, listen, the customer cares about the customer's experience, right? So uh, the we have to be intently focused on that because I think it's, for us, it is about supporting the uh, long-term uh, customer success. Customer has to have a an LTL partner that supports that and has the reach and footprint to do that. Now, I think that the, in, as I mentioned earlier, the industry in total has gotten better. SIA relative to last year has got stepped back modestly. Uh, but I think on a key, a lot of the key differentiators that are included in the 30 some that are part of this survey, you know, we actually improved year over year and a couple of them we fell back. Some of them we fell back on are, are areas that are, are uh, around pricing. So sometimes customers don't like the feedback that size is coming in and raising rates consistently or charging for accessorials consistently. Um, those are things that you sometimes that customers don't, you know, don't like that and you get negative feedback with that. So in some ways that's actually a good thing for us, but that's not to say what we have to be able to do is be consistently better for the customer. And that's, that's our focus. Uh, when you're in a growth mode like we are and growing versus the rest of the industry, you know, the you're taking on more customers that have new experience that haven't been with SIA before, and, you know, they have an experience, and we got to make sure that we're, you know, delivering to meet their expectations, um, and that's where we'll long-term be successful. We like the direction. We like the company's commitment to it. Um, you know, we're not doubling. We're doubling down on it, that's for sure. Understood. That's really helpful. And maybe as a follow-up, uh, just to go back to 4QOR, I think you said normal seasonality that you have is uh, 250 deterioration. Kind of our model has something closer to 150. Uh, so I think the 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 comparison is a little bit different. So just to level set, do you also have your normal seasonality benchmark for 1Q and 2Q? Thanks. Uh, I mean, what you, Robbie, you maybe yours is going a little bit further back. I mean, one of the pieces for us that we try to do for this is. If you ten years back is just not that valuable for us anymore. The company's changed so much over time. We've opened so many facilities, so some of those sequential trends just aren't really as valuable. So we try to look at something more applicable for the the recent period. And and we we haven't given anything out for into next year Q1 and, and Q2 yet, but we'll do that as we get closer to it. Yeah, we, Great, we thank took you. the COVID year. We took the COVID year out, of, right. out of the yeah. horizon, but we just looked back at recent recent years. Understood. Thank you. And your next question comes from Stephanie Moore with Jeffries. Your line is open. Hi. Uh, hi. Good morning. Thank you. Um, morning. I it's just a quick one for me here. Um, as a follow-up to, I think it was Tom's question earlier. We talked a little bit about 2025, and I think clearly gave your view on a, a test, um, you know, scenarios in a neutral macro, but. In that stronger environment scenario, how are you positioned to kind of take advantage of that inflection? Would we need to see incremental hiring equipment or anything else to position you to handle that inflection? Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, listen, if you scale the business from here, right, uh, we would certainly, our variable labor costs would, would certainly uh, change as well. They likely would go up because, and we would, you know, have to match driver counts of growth were higher than what we had expected. Um, we feel like we're staffed well right now for, um, you know, kind of the environment that we're in. I think it's a pretty good match. But as you get out into the year, you can imagine a scenario in which, you know, volume's up, maybe it's up materially, just throwing out as an illustration. You'd expect us to, you know, we'll scale the business, but we'll still have to add some labor costs. I mean, the volume wouldn't be free. 
Um, so I think it, uh, but I think what's really exciting, the, the big lift, the, the 21 facilities are open this year are going to be in position and they, they will scale. That's why we did this. So, you know, in a, in a stronger background, I'd much rather be in a position to start the year with 214 facilities, well positioned, ready to go. And we know that we know how to operate and, and we know how to scale up if we have to. And we also know how to match uh, down as we need to if you got into an environment where maybe the volumes work there, we would make adjustments on, on that basis. But um, it's a, uh, it, it, the opportunity is certainly there in front of us, and that, that's why we made the investments that we've made. Great. Appreciate it. And your next question comes from Bascom Majors with Susquehanna. Your line is open. As you think into the next year and talking about that, you know, CapEx preliminary spend of call it, you know, this year's billion or so minus the 250 million or so you spent on the unique transaction. I mean, it looks like that would put you a little above your sort of long-term high end of, of 15 percent of revenue um are we tapering back into that range longer term just any thoughts on you know the the investment in the business organically and, and when we might get to the point where you know you're inflecting on cash flow to the point where where, where, where you might want to return some of that to investors uh in dividends or buybacks thank you hey back yeah so i mean it's certainly if you look at a percent of revenue it's it's elevated the couple things to note in that the company's bigger now the to start to make sure we have capacity to flex with customers needs all of that's a, a bigger number than what it used to be so that's in that as well and you know for us when you look at that denominator pricing is a big player in that if, if our pricing gets to market naturally everything else as a percent of revenue comes back down so it's you know, we look at that and focus on that as well. Now, in the long term, it, it should trend back down as we continue to grow as a business and close the pricing gap and, and look at it from a percent of revenue standpoint. But it remains elevated uh, into next year, just as probably a little bit more heavy on the on the tractor side uh, versus trailers this year. So, um, but longer term, that should continue to come down. And then to the second part of that question, you know, we're probably not not too far out from having that discussion. The the big transaction at the beginning of the year, probably first of all, was the right move for us as a business, but that impacts that timing a little bit. But we're not we're not too far out from that. We've we've proved that the return on capital for our approach has been very valuable so far, and it was important to continue to get the network built out. But we remain focused on making sure that the returns are there. As a brief follow up to your point about getting your pricing to market, I mean, we can compare, you know, reported yields for you guys and peers, but there's obviously a huge mixed component there. Um, what's your assessment of how far you might be below market in, as we think about closing that gap over a multi year period? Thank you. Yeah, good question. I, I think what I would, this is kind of how we focus on it. We, we look at public, public uh, data and what revenue per shipment is and compare our revenue per shipment to others. And certainly we know there's some that have a mix of business that may or may not be the same as ours. Um, but fundamentally, we look at those and say, well, we, maybe we ought to adjust the, our mix of business or can pursue a more optimal mix of business that, you know, allows us to get the pricing that, you know, we see others getting. That is fundamentally the opportunity, right? And part of this, this, Network expansion is about making sure that we have the addressable market to be able to do that and the opportunity to get the at-bats with customers, get their freight, do a great job for them, and get us to market more. You know, the network is more and more comparable now. It's a national network comparable to any of those. So now it's just we got to keep focus, and that's that's a big opportunity. Thank you. And your next question comes from Chris Kuhn with the Benchmark Company. Your line is open. Yeah, hi, Chris. Hi, Matt. Thanks for the question. Just, the, I know in the, the second quarter, the terminals were larger um, and some of the costs you called out uh, on the call. And uh, as we think about the terminals for next year, anything to think about in terms of the size or the cost of the relocations, or are they going to be kind of like, like the third quarter, a little bit smaller, a little bit more manageable? Yeah, the, the relocations are, 
are candidly pretty straightforward. Um, I, I know some would say they're incredibly complicated. They're really not. Basically, what you do is you get the facility, the new facility set up and ready to go. You know, have the drivers report, team report to a different location Monday morning, and that kind of gets you started. So, the the oh, typically you don't see much in the way of overlap costs, those sorts of things. You're, it's kind of game on. In many cases, you have immediate efficiencies. So relocations really don't have a meaningful impact on the cost structure. Uh, typically, they offer uh, some efficiencies or, uh, you know, sort of those kinds of enhance enhancements. To the extent that we see opportunistic openings next year, they're, it's, they're going to be um, the scale of them. They may be, you know, it could be a range of sizes, but the impact on a business that is, you know, if you add a handful, four or five, to a footprint of 214 with the run rate of revenue that we have, that those are sort of more de minimis impacts. When you add 11 and a quarter like we just did, or six big ones like we did in the second quarter, they, they have a meaningful impact. So I think as we go from here, um, you know, I think they, they, they'll have a smaller and smaller impact. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Fritz. No problem. And your final question comes from Tyler Brown with Raymond James. Your line is open. Hey, morning. Can you all hear me? Absolutely. Can you hear it? More importantly, yeah. can you hear us, Tyler? <laughs> we can hear you. Hey, uh, Fritz, I want to I want to come back to the new employee um, ad comment that you made earlier. I'm assuming that the vast majority of those are frontline. Um, so, how do you feel about frontline productivity? I mean, could productivity be a really big positive story in 25, maybe even into 26, as basically all these guys mature? Um, I would assume your productivity metrics are probably considerably off your peak. Yeah, listen, they, they, they are, there's an opportunity to improve that as we, as our team um, matures, uh, new folks on the team uh, really kind of, uh, we feel like we've done a great job of onboarding people, but for that to, to really have that SIA sort of uh, feel, you got to continue getting that experience and understand through thick and thin, this is what we do for the customer. Um, and then I think as, as, as that grows, uh, I think you also get, uh, efficiencies with that productivity out of that, and then frankly, in a you know in a mar new markets as you you build density around those uh, city pickup operations, that's that's naturally going to come just because you've got a you know you've got an interest you don't start out fully uh, utilized, so there's going to leverage point there as well. So I think that um, you know going forward, I think there's a lot of right out of that sort of uh, maturity. Yeah. Okay. And this is maybe a good fitting into the, the call. It's a big picture question, but, you know, culture is obviously huge in LPL. You know this. I mean, I know this. I've seen it up close and personal, but how do you, how do you hold on to culture? I mean, you've got so many new people coming in. How do your internal employee surveys look and are they kind of where you want them to be? Thanks guys. So uh, our, our employee engagements, we measure that uh, every year. And uh, we have, through the changes, uh, we've maintained uh, our employee engagement scores, which have been pretty high for the last three years, and we've kept that up. So we're thrilled with that, but you can always get better. And um, so what we do is we break down uh, the employee engagement scores down to all the managers in the company. And our thoughts are is that, listen, you've performed well uh, on your employee engagement this year. What are you going to do next year to get even better? And if you've got somebody that's got, you know, an engagement opportunity, what are we going to do to train and support that person to be successful? So, yeah, we're, we're uh, intensely focused on that because, as you rightly point out, Tyler, this, this is a business that is – we can talk about capital. We can talk about all those things. But fundamentally, it's the people that make this happen. We have an awesome team. We'll continue to invest in our team, um, and we'll continue to drive engagement across this team. So that's an important part of the success. Um, that's why we feel pretty good about, you know, listen, this Massio, um, you know, sort of uh, change this year. This will be an opportunity. we got the team that's going to engage on that because they, they think it's important. And, uh, you know, the customer's the first thing is an important company making that happen. That's uh, that's part of, our, part of our culture. So we're – we're well positioned for that. We just got to keep it keep it focused. 
Perfect. Thanks, guys. And that concludes our question and answer session. I will now turn the conference back over to Mr. Fritz Holtzgrave for closing remarks. Thank you, uh, operator. Uh, first, I, I want to thank everyone on the call for their patience. I know that we had a little bit of technical issue here, at least for part of this. Um, and we apologize for that. And we know that it's been a couple of quarters of that, but uh, trust us when we say that that is something that uh, we'll continue to figure out a way to get that right. Um, uh, I know for the first 10 years that I was with the company, we didn't have any challenges with it. It's just more of a recent thing, but uh, we're, we're on it. So, but if, if there are folks that, that maybe didn't get all the detail that they were looking for, um, uh, or uh, feel free to reach out, uh, and, and Matt and I will, will certainly field uh, any questions that may have fallen through the cracks there. But if you, if you did, uh, came in and out or, or, the important thing is that we're really excited about uh, kind of where the company is. We just opened 11 facilities in the third quarter. Uh, significantly, we're already starting to see a lot of value generated out of the six that we opened in the second quarter. And this supports the long-term value proposition of the company. Uh, we're excited about the prospects going forward. Uh, certainly, we've made significant investments in the business this year. Uh, those invest investments have an eye to the long-term success of the business. Uh, we're doubling down on, on uh, focusing on taking care of the customer. That's our intense focus because we see a lot of value that we'll, uh, that we'll provide to customers from this network, this now national network, uh, into the years to come. So uh, we're excited about the position, and uh, we appreciate your time and interest in SIA. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's call, and we thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.